diolch yn fawr, diolch yn gofyn i fi ddod meddu i siarad chi. Mae'ch cwmni chi bod yn unigol. I thank you very much for asking me to come and talk to you today. Your company has been unique and I hope I justify uh, what I'm here for. Thank you. Um, I'll start off to s a few words of how I started and what I am and I'll go through actions that I've been involved in and how the campaign in the UK built up to a climax to make the UK GM free and Wales GM free. And I'll follow that by explaining more the reasons why we should question whether we need GM and, it, and the dangers if we go on that path. Right, I farm about 30 miles away from here. My farm runs down to the uh, coast. This is Abraithi Beach. This is my wonderful family. This is my backbone of my life. And these are my piggies and <laughs> my Welsh black cows. Now this is the farm with where it's sit situated, 120 acres. It's gone through several changes in the time I've farmed. We used to farm, uh, we used to have dairy cows, we used to have 70 cows, milk 70 cows, grew 50 acres of potatoes, had 30 followers, 30 acres of barley. We used to employ 25 casual people, two full-time workers. Our casual wages bill back in the 1970s was 35,000 and that was all going local. Now what's happened? We've changed. We've diversified to survive. In 2003, we had to sell the cows because the price of milk dropped from 29 to 16 p a litre. I was losing 10,000 pound a year and I had to, after I'd bred a herd for 40 years, I had to decide to sell them and change my ways and options to make a living. Now we've got pigs, organic pigs and beef we farm people and horses because we're in a tourist area and our biggest asset is that scene. These are some of our pigs and they're wonderful, wonderful pets. A, uh, a pig is nearly as intelligent as a human being. I usually talk a lot to my pigs, and if you need a psychiatrist, buy a pig, because it listens to every word. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beginning. Now then, in 1998 to 2003, crop trials w were done all over the UK. Two were done in, in Wales. One of them was going to be done in Mathry, which is only about six miles away from my farm, and the other one in North Wales. Now, this all started off, I had a phone call from Tom Latter, a neighbour of mine who's organic, to come up to his farm one evening to have a meeting with a group of other concerned members. And we found out that there was going to be a GM trial, a T25 maize, going to be drilled in a field near Mathry. We decided, quite possible, we wanted to see whether the community was concerned. So we asked Friends of the Earth to come down to a meeting, and we were involved as well. We thought we'd have a meeting in, in Mathry Hall and a few people would turn up. Instead, over 300 people turned up. The place was jam-packed. And we decided we had to do something about it. We had to campaign and try to really change the farmer's mind on planting this. I knew the farmer that was actually going to plant this because I, I used to coach his sons in rugby. So I set up meetings between him and ourselves and I was the mediator between. I used to visit his farm, his house on a daily basis, debating about GM and its consequences. Big pressure built up in the area. The community set up a 24-hour vigil on the field. 
in case they would try to drill it. The media got involved. Thank goodness for mobile phones. Thank goodness for media. We used every tool we had at our, uh, at our, that we could use. Uh, the, the media were really hanging on to it. At one time, I was having eight interviews a day on this situation. A funny part of it uh, that happened during that time, um, I had a phone call because everybody where they were watching the field and they were, it was getting springtime, it was ploughed, it was getting close to being drilled. I had a phone call saying that there was a, a tractor with a maze drill on, on the back of it with a police escort on the Hafford West to Brody Road. <laughs> Well, um, the whole thing went ballistic. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it? It was the Duke of Edinburgh visiting Brody. He'd caught up with a tractor and drill. And of course... <laughs> anyway, we went, we went to see Michael Meacher. We... Um, we brought scientists down to do lectures for the community. I took scientists up to see the farmer and have one-on-one -on -one talk with him. And in the end, he withdrew. It took six weeks of solid uh, lobbying and campaigning, but we won it in six weeks. And that was the formation of our, our group, GM Free Cymru. This, this uh, logo, we set up a competition to our local primary schools and that logo was designed by an eight-year-old boy. So that's our standard at the moment. From there, uh, there was another um, trial up in Zealand. This is the farmer. I contacted the farmer and started talking to him to discuss because um, a farmer will talk to a farmer and listen to a farmer, but when an environmentalist comes and talks to a farmer, you, you draw a, a blank. I went up to his farm, I went round to see the crops with him, I tried to persuade him, but he was adamant. We even set up a conference down in Pembrokeshire and Hayes Castle of three scientists that were pro from CropGen and three that were against. And we invited councillors from the area and we, we brought the farmer down. Even after all that, he wouldn't change his mind. Later that month, a demonstration started up in, I was invited up there to speak in a demonstration. They had one up in Zealand and Flintshire. After the demonstration, everybody was dressed in white suits. We marched to the farm. We had an interview with the farmer. The, he had security guards in the field, 24 security guards. Some people jumped over the gate to go into the field. George Mombe was one there, one of, part of our group. And we went into, into the field and tried to destroy it. Police came, six were arrested. And then not all of it were destroyed, but all, later on it was. When I got home, I was um, told to come into the Hufford West Police Station to be interviewed. On the grounds that I uh, had been trespassed and as well that I was part of destroying the crop. I took a solicitor with me into the police station and they started the interview. They asked my name and whatnot. Before they went on, my solicitor asked, have you got any evidence against my client? Have you got any uh, photographic evidence? And they said, no. And they said, she's, well, my solicitor said, well, you can't, you've got no right to keep my client. As I walked out, the police officer that interviewed me slapped me on my back and said, well done. <laughs> These are photographs from Zealand as well. <coughs> from there, Scotland. There was oilseed rape trials up in Scotland. What we, what we found during that time, because of concerned campaigners from each 
area, it empowered and encouraged other campaigners in other areas to build up resistance about it. And at the end, I'll show you why, really, we should be vigil against this. They set up a yurt on the edge of, of a field. This was about uh, 18 hectares of oilseed rape. 28 were arrested because of um, trying to destroy the crop. One thing they did there, which I thought was very funny, they, they, and, and which really made headline news in, in Scotland, uh, they bought four Range Rovers, they put bars on the back of the Range Rover and they drove into the crop to try and flatten the crop. But each driver was dressed up as Tony Blair and the headline news was Tony Blair tries to smash GM crops. <laughs> This is the report on it. I've jumped one forward now. This is another, from there, um, the campaigners down in Dorset um, started their campaign. The farmer there I tried to get in touch with, but when I talked to him on the phone, I'd hold the phone out here because he was calling me all kinds of names because I, I was a Welshman um, interfering on what he was doing and he wouldn't listen at all. These campaigners set up this castle in the field to stop them going in to drill it. And this is the campsite. But then they, um, the police came and destroyed, the, took down the castle. They went in and they drilled the crop. But the campaigners, they wouldn't give up. What they did, they went and picked up all the seeds of the GM in the drills. They picked them up, rebagged them, and replanted it with organic maize. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's the report. You don't want to read it now. I, I haven't got time, sorry. <laughs> From the, um, all because of these successions or campaigns, we decided to network and work together as a UK group. And in 2002, there was uh, 42 trial plots all over the UK. And we decided to work together to take token uh, pieces of crop from each section all over the UK, working from Scotland down to south of England. And we did 19 in 24 hours labelled it and um, put on the bag what field it had come from, what OS number and what crop it was and we delivered it to the doorstep of DEFRA. Six of us made a statement, I was one of them, I signed a, a statement saying that I had uh, pulled this crop where I had pulled it, why I would pulled it, my co contact details, name and address, if they wish to take proceedings against me, would they please do so? And we heard nothing. This was a series, w w with all the trials that had been done in the UK, it ended up in the end, in 2003, only one trial. And this was because of the building of, of resistance in the UK against this. From there, I was invited to join the uh, strategy committee uh, that was planning a big demonstration in 2003, uh, the tractors and trolleys, where people would, taking part in it, would take, make a pilgrimage and travel from all parts of the UK. One person cycled, towing a coffin, all the way from Scotland down to London. It was all timed and planned. Well, my book is there, which is planned detail day by day, because I decided to tra drive a tractor from my farm in St. David's, via Birmingham, down to Coventry, down to London. It took me eight days to travel 380 miles. My tractor, because th this is the tractor, is the tractor I use every day on the farm. It is a JCB teleporter. And the bearings on it would overheat after two hours. So every two hours, I would have to stop, 
cool it for one hour, and then carry on the journey. <laughs> but it, it was an immense, wonderful time. It had a real impact. We traveled all the way during that time. Uh, uh, each radio station in every area we traveled through was talking about GM and it really had an impact. And when we got to London, there was 2,000 people that arrived there for this demonstration. And it was one, one of the biggest ones in London, to, especially to do with food. And our aim was to travel and to go through London and call in the NFAO office, drop a petition there, number 10 Downing Street, and DEFRA. And uh, because the NFA in this country is, is pro-GM and thinks it's important that farmers have a choice to grow GM. So these are some of the photos that were taken during that time. Possibly I got too many for you. But it, it was a, a really uh, good occasion. But there was people that had walked and cycled and people traveling with trolleys well, from London, taking food and things with them to really create an impact. From this, what happened after this was that even after this response from the public, Tony Blake commercialized the growing of T25 maize in the UK. He didn't listen to the public at all, but he commercialized it. But it hasn't been grown. Syngenta, who were promoting the T25 maize after this, pulled their offices out of the UK and moved to France, which was a victory. If they, they felt that the public opposition was too great for them to try and promote it in this country. This country in Wales has been fully supportive against GM and it has been across all parties that they voted wholeheartedly to keep Wales GM free. This is a legislation proposed by the Assembly and uh, hopefully it will come into law or legislations they're proposing that if a farmer wants to grow a GM crop in the UK, in Wales, he's got to register three months prior to planting. He's got to go through a, co a course, get a certificate for that course. He's got to inform farmers near that field that he is actually going to grow this crop and he's got to warn the contractors because this is all to do with contamination and GM producers, they will be inspected. Also, it makes the farmer liable. If he contaminates another farmer, the farmer is liable and the seed merchant is liable. This, this really sets a precedence in, in the UK. Scotland is, uh, is thinking of doing the same thing. Ireland is thinking of doing the same thing, but England won't. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. Will the pressures of the Celtic band around England, what parliament will decide what to do with the UK? This is Dr. Albert Putsai. He's a scientist that worked in Inverness University. The university was sponsored by um, Monsanto and he was approached to do an experiment on potatoes. He, they wanted him to create potatoes that were resistant to green fly. The way he decided to do this was to cross the snowdrop with potatoes. And, but you'd think this was, would, would be harmless because you're, you're only taking another plant and another plant. Anyway, he, crossed the, the, he did the experiment. He decided to do his own research on it. He had three batches of rats. 
He fed one with conventional potato, one with the GM potato, and one with the snowdrop. Now from that you'd think those fed snowdrop will be affected. But what he found was that the rats developed um, a thickening of the walls of the stomach. And this is the first stages of cancer. He declared this to the public. He made a press release. He was sacked within 24 hours. His wife, who was working in the university, was sacked. And he had to go back to Hungary in exile. And this was because of the pressure of Monsanto on him. And this is our food. Now, in these, GM is the modification of plants. It's changing, trying to affect the DNA by inserting genes of viruses, antibiotic-resistant genes, into the plant to make them resistant to glyphosate, that's Roundup, or make them create their own chemical through their root system to uh, kill off insects that um, really affect that plant. By creating this, they're creating a BT strain. Now, one of the, uh, I met a farmer, I was out in Lucerne in March this year, and I'd heard about this German farmer, and he had lost cows through feeding this. He was a small farmer, he had 70 cows, his herd was pedigree, he'd won a cups with his herd, he had a son that was going to follow in his footsteps. He was approached by a company to do trials on BT176 maize. He thought it was a brilliant crop when he showed me photos of the two conventional maize and BT176. Even to me it looked very good, I, I, I'd be keen on it. He was so intrigued by this, growing this crop, he grew half of his crop as BT176 maize. The winter he tried feeding it to his cows, his cows fell ill. He spent a fortune on vets to try, because as a farmer you always put yourself to blame and you try to cure the animal, you think it's the digestion, you think it's what you're feeding it. Anyway, he lost 12 cows. Even the slurry that was coming out of those cows, he spread on the grass the next spring. The cows fell ill and when they analysed them, it had killed the bacteria in the rumen of the cows. And now he, he hasn't got a farm, he's lost his cows, he's lost a lot. So we've got to be very cautious with this. Is there enough research done into it? There needs to be far more research done into this before we actually say that it's safe. It should be done in a totally controlled environment. And this goes into our food supply. Is it, it might be safe for us. Is it safe for our grandchildren? Because th this is what I'm dead against because um, another farmer I met, Percy Schmeiser, you might have heard of him. I brought him over in October to make a, a talks right round the UK. Well, he did 10 talks for us. And he's been uh, presented with an equal to the Nobel Prize for um, doing things in the environment. He was taken to court from, uh, by Monsanto for using GM seeds. He grew canola, oilseed rape. He had 1,500 acres of canola. GM canola was grown outside the boundaries of his farm, cross-pollinated with his um, seed. And Monsanto came onto his farm, took a sample of the seed, put an injunction against him, and took him to court. During the period the injunction had been served and the trial, Two Monsanto men were sitting outside his, car, uh, outside his house 24 hours a day, following everywhere he went, monitoring what he did. He lost the case. It cost him $440,000. He he's lost the rights to his own seed. 
A neighbor of his, while he was over here, said uh, an, uh, an elderly lady who had about a thousand acres and grew oilseed drip, Monsanto came onto her farm and asked her, uh, we'd like to test the seed you've got in your store. And she wouldn't have it. She brought a gun out and she told them to get off her yard. <laughs> what did they do? They got a helicopter. They, fu they fill balloons up with Roundup. They fly over the crop. It's called Roundup bombing. And they drop the balloon and it hits the crop and it spreads. They come back in a week. If that crop has died, they know it's not theirs. If it survived, then they'll put an injunction against the farmer. <coughs> BT cotton in, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> this last, okay. BT cotton has been introduced in India. It's one of the, uh, it's in its third generation. They are found, uh, usually India farmers graze the cotton as part of their uh, farming rotation. What they found with BT cotton, they lost about 12,000 sheep because they grazed the cotton. Right, so we've got to decide. I'll close it now, but my main concerns is the right to our seed, the right of choice to our food, because if we permit this to happen, and I feel strongly and passionately about it. Everyone should be aware of it and should know exactly that this will take away your choice of food. It'll kill organic completely and all will be GM. Are we responsible for what our grandchildren? We've, it's our legacy to m do something about this. Thank you.